We need legal scholar activists to rethink the way in which we plan and exploit, I would say, destroy our environment. We need legal scholars to reconceptualize gender relations both within the family and outside it. We need the legal scholar activists to animate our criminal law and demonstrate the manner in which so many of the rules which we apply to ostensibly criminal behavior are the product of demented and controlling minds. So who then is the ideal legal scholar activist? In 1993, the late Edward Said, who taught at Columbia University, philosopher at Columbia University, stated that the basic mission of a public intellectual should be to advance human freedom and knowledge. This mission often means standing outside of society and its institutions and actively disturbing the status quo, challenging the status quo, turning it over, turning it upside down. At the same time, Said intellectual is part of society and should address his or her concerns to wider, as wide a public as possible. And Said intellectual is constantly balancing the private and the, the public. So how does the intellectual stand both within and outside society? How do you achieve this goal of finding common ground between your personal proclivities and the interests of society? I'd like to apply Said's perspective to two experiences that I have undergone and personally involved in, in order to demonstrate the different dimensions of the legal scholar activist as I see it. These two examples both come from Uganda, but being a neighbor, uh, some people have even said being a former colony of Kenya, uh, I'm sure you will relate very much to uh, the situation in that context. In Uganda a number of years ago, we had a, a debate concerning the amendment of the Constitution. Our constitution was promulgated in 1995. This is after several years of turmoil and disorder. The key issue in the transformation of that constitution, or the amendment of that constitution, was whether to allow President Museveni to stand for a third term. Now, those of you who may not know, President Museveni came to power through via a military insurrection in 1986. Um, so for 10 years, he was basically what you call a, a rebel with a cause. Uh, until 1996, then he became, I don't know, I guess a, a, a leg legitimized rebel with another, a different type of force. Now, the question was, in, in the 1995 constitution, we put a two-term limit. As it came to its end, one of the issues that came up was, should the term limits be opened up? I opposed both the proposed amendments as well as the projected manner in which the changes to the constitution were intended to be effected which was by a referendum. My argument was that a referendum to amend the Constitution was not the proper method because that's not what the Constitution stipulated of affecting change. Since the letter of the Constitution simply did not allow it, and also I was against the basic fact that increasing the terms of a president who by that time had been in power for nearly uh, 20 years was a bad idea for Ukrainian democracy. Invariably, these criticisms drew a negative reaction from State House, I was accused of being elitist and of having acquainted the common people of Uganda to a mob because I said that a referendum in the conditions then prevailing would amount to mob justice. Perhaps the most friendly attack that I got was to be described as an armchair politician and being dared to submit myself to the electoral process and demonstrate that my ideas truly resonated with the general public. You go to the people and see if they vote for you. President Seven himself labeled me an agent of disorientation. And I was obviously very accused of partisanship. To this day, the State House website carries an unflattering description of me as attempting to spread half ideological and political truths about the democratization process in Uganda. Out of the third term debates, I learned that the legal scholar activists to be active to be active on the political social scene is impossible. To, be avoid, to avoid being labeled as partisan. Indeed, the higher the degree of your activism and engagement, the greater the likelihood that you'll be described as opposition. If you're not on the same page as the government of the day, you'll be regarded as against them, and all manner of action can be taken against you. But I've also learned other things. I've learned that it's better to be labeled political partisan than to be described 
as what Lenin calls a useful idiot, than to stand aside and allow society, even if it is the majority of society, to take away certain basic freedoms and liberties of any vulnerable minority, however detested or reviled by a wider society. And in my view, there lies the rock. Thank you very much.